We're streaming? Yeah. We be streaming. We could okay look we have we have stuff here. It could go live. We I think we're live. We I think we're streaming. live. It says we're live. I can't live. see a picture. Do you see a picture on there, Davis? Oh. Ooh, I see a picture oh, right there. I think that's we're live. Have, we've had a little bit of technical difficulties here, guys, so just let us know in the chat if we're doing a good job. It says excellent connection. It yep, says it's live. live. And we're waiting for the fans to come in here. Cool. But can you see it on your phone? Yep, we are live. Wow, we are live, Let's Jason. Let's go. Wow, guys, how's the audio sound now? Does it sound good? Because we, we were on before, and it wasn't very good. So it's working. OK, people are saying it's working. We're, we're good. It's fantastic. All right, Jason, so again, just want to let you know, I might interrupt you. If someone sends a super chat, I'm going to interrupt Not the whole problem. thing Not a problem. and give them a shout out. Otherwise, we're going to keep going. Sounds good. Guys, today we're talking about wade fishing, right? So this is the, it's actually a really fun way to catch fish. You know, you could obviously you need a pair of waders. I mean, you can, you can do it without waders, but I highly recommend having waders. And it's just going chest deep in the water and, and, and finding fish. That's what it's all about. And uh, I guess that's the first thing we'll talk about is how do we find fish weight fishing? So I would say the easiest way to find fish, and you know, this is probably something a lot of people know, but it's a term called reading the water. Reading the water is, you know, something that takes experience. You can't just Google or YouTube how to read the water. So reading the water takes experience. You gotta get out on the water, you gotta go fishing, you can't it's too windy, it's too cold, it's too hot, it's too this, you just gotta go. So for and sometimes sometimes on those days where you think it's gonna be horrible, it could be the most insane thing. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. I mean curveballs. There there's too many fishermen, and I'm including us in this conversation, that look for too perfect of days. You know, when uh, we when we can look back at some of our best days, everything might not have lined up how we thought it was going to, you know what yeah, I mean? And, that, and that's what makes it fun about that. fishing. I mean, the unpredictability of what you're going to see, what you're going to learn, what you're going to catch. I think know? I think sometimes we, we get a little, uh, not stuck up, but like we get like, you know, I'm not going out there if it's not like these conditions, yeah, you know? And totally. you, know, you might be missing out on something really, really good. Totally. I mean, I, I would so say- So re reading the water, where do we, you know, well, I was gonna, I was yeah. gonna even touch on that about this morning because this morning I was out and you know we had wind in our face, we had dirty water, Ooh. and it wasn't ideal. And even the people that I was with, they were looking at me like, "You sure you want to go here?" And I'm like, "Yeah." So we go, we walk this flat. We're not really having much luck, and then we just come upon a great group of fish, and we must have caught, I don't know, 20 sea trout in 30 casts. Really? So that's you know, kind of fast and furious catching them. Um, you know, it's definitely not always like First that. First super chat, elite hook set. Can you give me some more tips on how to grow? Um, grow eat, eat and more hide. food. You know, I I, I don't know. Uh, protein. Protein. More protein. <laughs> eat more protein. There we go. Elite, or yeah, elite hook set. There you go. How to grow? Yes. Eat more food. <laughs> Um, yeah, so, <laughs> um, I mean, I yeah. told you, you get, you get some curveballs here. So, These super chats, man, yeah, I'm, I'm you know, little, we're going to answer them. I'm not sure where to go from there after that question. You but, just totally threw them off, guys. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, about, about finding fish and, and about growing, I mean, you know, they, they kind of relate because getting back again to this morning, the gentleman was pretty short. So if you're short, you can't necessarily always go when it's high tide. Um, you know, sometimes when it is high tide, you're stuck on a shoreline. So you can't really walk a flat and cover the area that you want to cover to know if there's fish there. Um, so if you are struggling in your height, maybe uh, look for lower tide. He just came back, Elite Hooks at YouTube channel, how to grow his YouTube channel. Well, I'm gonna tell you the biggest ah. secret to growing a YouTube channel right now, ready? Being consistent and making unique content. That's what it's all about there. Be unique and, be, and be consistent and you'll grow. Good tip, Josh. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, just generalization of how to find fish, you know, reading the water is obviously very important, looking for bait, looking for birds, looking for life. Um, life could be, like I said, birds. Life could be a porpoise. Life could be anything. I mean- Do you really want to wade fish with a 
Dolphin. It, as crazy as it sounds, I've caught plenty of fish around porpoises. And really? Actually, if you can remember, I think we were with someone, I don't remember his name, in Sebastian, where we had a bunch of dolphins around us, porpoises around us, and we were still catching fish. Oh, yes, Glen Austin. Yeah. So, you know, that it's definitely crazy. possible. Remember, they were trying I mean, to eat, the, eat our trout? Right, right. We, we caught a nice trout that day, too, yep. like a 27, 28 yep. incher. You know what's funny, guys? So, Jason was the first guy that I went with. I caught my first trout with Jason. And, um, you know, I didn't really, I was, did my first weight fishing with Jason, too. Um, and uh, remember that first trout I hooked? Mm. Mm-hmm. I still, I still honestly do remember that, and, and <laughs> I, it's kind of good that you bring that up because, you know, when how you, big was that fish? Is he 30 I'm not plus? gonna lie. I mean, it was probably pushing gator status, which gator status here is 30 plus, 25 to 30 inches. Oh, so, he was big. He was bigger than 25 inches. You know, I mean, it was the biggest trout I've ever seen, still well, to this day. Yeah, but when you start talking about 30 plus inch trout, yeah. You, you know you have a giant on your hand because any 30 plus inch trout I've caught or I've put someone on, always they think they have a big snook or a redfish or something and that's, what I that's why right I, in front I, of I you. had a heavy drag on that fish. I thought, oh man, I got some good on right, here. I, right. I, was like, it's, I thought it was a snook. Right. And then I've never seen a trout that big before and it was like, just like you yeah, said. And, and just anxiousness took over. I mean, if you, if you reel the fish in too quick and, and the fish is in front of you freaking out, they tend to just pop off because they're so erratic. You almost want to let them do that away from you a little bit, yeah. and then kind of when they calm down, you know, keep you know keep pressure, keep the rod so bent. So someone told me that. Fish. And I remember, I think you have a different different opinion about this, but using a wading net. Now, yeah. With trout, I, does that damage their, their so slime? The the thing with the wading net is. Nets are made out of a lot of different materials, and when I say I don't use a net, I just, I don't necessarily want to invest in a very high-end net. So I would rather have that close combat of grabbing the fish and, you know, sometimes losing them, sometimes not. But if you have a net that has knots, like the way it's the netting is made, Mm -hmm. the knots itself could knock slime off or scale off of the fish that you're trying to release, whether it's in season or not in season. Yeah. And there's some nets that, you know, have a very smooth coating and that's just better for a catch and release fish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and it's not gonna damage the fish as much. So that's pretty much the, the reasoning on why I don't use a net. Is I, I like grabbing the fish. So. Got another super chat here. Paradise Fishing, been watching for five years now. Love your videos. Can you please shout out Paradise Fishing on YouTube? Absolutely, Par- guys, check out Paradise, Paradise. Fishing on YouTube. Um, yeah, I wish we had a net that day with that one, dude. That yeah. was very, uh, I'm still heartbroken with yeah. that. Until, yeah. when you lose a big fish, and it's the biggest one you've ever seen, mm. the biggest one you've ever hooked. It um, haunts you. It, it haunts you until you catch something <laughs> bigger. You know, like, like, like I remember, uh, well, I'll, I'll put it this way, right? I was in Louisiana this past, uh, a couple weeks ago. I hooked, like, a 25-pound triple tail. Mm. And he pulled off. Mm. But... I didn't really care that much because of the one I caught. So I know that sounds kind of snooty, but like no. when you've caught them almost twice that big, right, right, you know, right. not 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 actually twice, but you know, like a forty-pound fish, um, you're like, eh. so, you know, yeah, yeah. You know, mean, it's, it's hard to get heartbroken. I still was set. I still was upset. Oh, but, totally. But not as much. I mean, any any fish you lose, you know, sucks. But I, I look at losing fish as kind of a learning curve. You know, you almost figure out what not to do you know so it's almost good in a way to learn to lose fish because it helps you land more fish yeah um you know when i was learning how to fish i mean i wanted to reel the fish in all the way literally to the rod tip and a lot of people do that because of excitement you're just reeling and reeling and the next thing you know you got the fish and it's at the end of the rod tip there's no line out and you're going what now and it comes off and then it comes back (laughs) to the conversation of i wish we had a net yeah. So, you know, just when, when excitement is happening and, you know, you got a big fish on, try to be very clear, clear headed and take your time and do everything right. So you can, you know, show your picture or have a better story to tell a friend or a family member in the future. Well, you, you hit it. I mean, and I know we're kind of like going all over the place right now, but like, I remember the fish I lost more than the fish I caught. Yeah. Way more. And before you learn how to catch fish, you get to learn how not to catch fish. In a way, it's, yeah. it's kind of, you know, like, well, that didn't work, you know? So, like, you know, you start learning. Like, like I always tell people, like, one of the most important things you could ever learn in fishing is learning when not to fish. Mm-hmm. 
you know, because then you save your time. Correct. That's and, and there's a lot of days when you should not be out fishing. Correct. You know, I know we were talking about that earlier, but yeah, you should. But and when it's blowing or when it's like the certain conditions of the water temperature is too hot or too cold, yeah, you don't waste your time. Going back to finding fish now, and yeah. that's kind of looping into that. So, wade fishing. What kind of bottom are you looking for? I know we've had so, a serious grass problem yeah, here in South yeah, Florida. Yeah, so that's but. actually a good conversation because so I'm gonna I'm gonna relate to two different people. I'm gonna relate to the boat fisherman and I'm gonna relate to the, you know, the land fisherman who just goes in the water and goes fishing. There's yeah. plenty of people who are in their boats. They go places and then they get out and wade. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one thing you you could do, take your rod and put it in the water and see if you have a hard bottom or a soft bottom. That's very simple whether you're just walking or you're in your boat and you want to stab the ground and, and kind of see hard bottom or soft bottom. Um, I prefer soft bottom. Soft Why? bottom is going to make it easier for the fish to feed. So I was thinking about this on my ride over here, how to really explain that. And if is I it, had the sand... There's crustaceans in it in that? Well, there, there's a lot of food in there. I mean, it could be shrimp, it could be crabs, it could be mm -hmm. bait fish. It's, it's as simple as saying if I had sand right here on the table and I went like this to grab something, how easy would my hand go through it? And easy. Then if, right. And then if I had a big pile of dirt here, my hand would go and then it would probably stick and it wouldn't just smoothly go through it. So imagine like a redfish or a drum or a croaker or anything that's kind of a bottom dweller, pompano. When they're feeding, you know, sometimes they're looking down, so they're rooting and and eating things and think about again the conversation we just had about soft bottom hard bottom it'll be easier for the fish to feed in that soft bottom because they don't have to work as hard it's not to say they won't be in a hard bottom but now they have to work harder so yeah. both may be productive areas but you when find, you find soft bottom yeah. normally it's more productive water now lately in florida guys we've had a huge problem with our grass because we've had a lot of freshwater dumping yes. whole different discussion not gonna open that can of worms right now but before all this nonsense happened did you notice the place of fishing a lot better with the grass oh 100 percent. i mean i just came from the west coast a couple weeks ago and their fishery over there has been closed for a couple years and i mean yeah. they they deal with freshwater runoff like we do but the amount of grass that's on the west coast of Florida compared to the Tampa? east coast of Florida, uh, uh, Charlotte Harbor. Okay. And, Was uh, there more grass over there? Yes. Lots of areas that have grass. I, mean, <sighs> I don't know how much time you spent over in that area. I have not wade fished over there, I can promise you that. But gorgeous flats, Josh. I mean, the turtle grass and the sea grass and just the life, I mean, in general. You, going and fishing with this guy at... I think it was 11 o'clock and throwing top waters and catching fish in clean water with bright sun. I would never take you fishing and say, hey, I want you to throw a top water at 11 in this clean water yeah, yeah, and yeah. expect you to catch fish. But we did in that scenario. So that just goes to show you how good the fishery is that, you know, it's just there are a lot of fish. So when we, you. We just got a comment. People say, yeah. I, I don't fish anymore. I, I just game. Well, Let's be honest, guys. I'll be honest. The weather's been so terrible here lately that. Uh, remember what I was saying earlier? When not to fish? Yeah, that's those, it's been pretty bad. I, I mean, mean, how many times have you been times. in the past month? How many times have you actually been fishing? Now you get you do mostly wading, so that's so, huge benefit. You always yeah. can get somewhere, but yeah, so offshore the, fishing. Right, right. So the wade fish. I mean, really, the whole month of November has been kind of crazy. A lot of rain, a lot of wind. Um, crazy. You know, yeah. Wind. I mean. I don't, I don't know about offshore fishing because I don't do a ton of it, but yeah. the, the people that have do it have probably not been offshore for weeks, you know, no. like you were saying. But in the river, when you're going wading or whatever, there is. There's plenty of shorelines to get out of. You know, you could look at your area from Google Maps and, and look at the way your shorelines are, are kind of set up and, and understand when you're planning your trip. You could, you know, northeast wind, southeast wind, whatever, and look at your shoreline and if you have a shoreline, you know, we'll, we'll just call this uh, north and south, and this would be east. So if you have a strong east wind, y your east side of whatever land this is is going to be protected. So yeah. you would want to spend the majority of your time on the calmer side. Yeah. Um, so for wade fishing, do you like, going back to finding fish, do you like being on the calm side or the rough side? Uh, I mean, sometimes it's... 
you know, instinct. Because um, I've noticed a lot of times when we go, we're always on the calmer side, you know, because most times we go, the weather's pretty horrible. Well, I know Davis likes to have good audio, so, yeah. yeah. We don't want to be too uh, windy. Too windy. Yeah. Well, Paradise Fishing um, again, you should come up to Long Island. I can show ooh, you a bunch of crazy fishing islands. spots. I would love that. Let's go, We, we were just island. there, actually, not too long ago. We were catching, uh, we were with uh, uh, Brooklyn Fishing Club and Rockfish Charters, and we were catching stripers right by the Statue of Liberty. It was pretty cool. Uh, Do you see that? Do you see that one? Yes. What yes. do you, you think of that? I loved it because it reminded me of home. I'm from Long Island. I caught Are a lot really? of striped bass when I was younger. No and way. I didn't know that. Stru uh, fluke and... and Tog togs? I call them blackfish when I was yeah. younger, but yeah. Yeah, I know. I'm all about that. All right, guys. Fun. Going back to weight fishing here, because we're going to get down to me and Jason. Jason, especially, he's he's a talker. We're so going to get in the meat and potatoes we're of this gonna get conversation. Some, we might go soon. down some rabbit holes here, too. <laughs> um, so, we've kind of set the ground where to where we find fish. We look, yeah. We're looking for soft bottom. Mm -hmm. We're fishing mostly on the calm side. I mean, yeah. does that really matter? Uh, well, I don't want white caps. You know, yeah. I don't want to be fishing in white caps, but... You know, as long as it's comfortable to the person and the person doesn't mind fishing in some wind, I mean, wind can totally be your friend. Mm -hmm. um, you know, sometimes, you know, going back to the perfect scenario, you have too perfect of a scenario and no wind and really clean water. All those fish that you're fishing for can see that much better. Yeah. So when the water's a little stained or it's a little windy, whatever, you now have the upper hand of catching the fish instead of the fish seeing your hooks and your leaders and everything so you know dirty water and wind sometimes is good okay so soft bottom you just, you know you know, like you said you got to time on the water figure out like and every area is different with wind you know some areas might produce better with certain winds you know it depends on where you live where you're fishing at yeah, your location like there's no fishing. exact formula here right oh uh, yeah exactly it's like beach fishing like like some beaches i know to go to when there's a certain wind and other beaches you go to a different wind Correct. same thing with offshore like when you have a west wind like, you know, one thing, uh, actually Carl told me this once, fish, usually offshore, always swim into the wind. So mm -hmm. when we get a strong west wind offshore, your kingfish, your sails, they'll be in shallower. Mm -hmm. They're going to they're gonna push it, they're going to fall, you know, they're going to put their nose into the wind kind of deal. Um, so going back to weight fishing, that, that would make sense, you know. So you might find a really nice, even if it is rough, they could be there. Yeah, you know? I mean, you also just kind of touched on something that I talk about quite a bit and is... It has to do with the angles of the way the fish are sitting. So mm -hmm. there's kind of two conversations here. You're going to have schooling fish, and then you're going to have, you know, solitary predator fish. Yeah. So the schooling fish will normally all be facing in one direction, where the solitary fish could be roaming, okay? He could be, or she could be facing any direction. Mm -hmm. So why I bring that up is... You could be walking a shoreline and throwing in one direction and not having any luck and then turn around and throw back where you came from and instantly start getting bites. Right, interrupted one sec. Cliff, yep. Cliffy, Christian, Christian, I can't pronounce your last name too well, but I, I might butcher this, Christian, I, I, I just, this better not be how do I grow yeah. again. Cliff, Cliffy, okay, right there, uh, come wade fishing in East Africa with us at the end of Cove Experience. Uh, Yes, I would love to do that, that and I have fun. no idea what you catch on the east side of Africa, but it sounds like a good time. It sounds like a really good time. Definitely. Africa? Uh, have, you ever, have you ever done, done any weight fishing in Africa? I can't say I have, sir, but that but would, would be you want pretty to? cool, without a doubt. Yes, we'll have, to do a doubt. A little, we'll have to do a little fundraise for Jason to that go to Africa fun. to do that some recon. Fun. That would be fun. He, he would very much like that. Okay, so let's talk about baits, baits yeah. that we're going to use. So, um, I would, I'm not going to... I'm going to say most of the fish I've caught waiting have been on it with a, a jig head mm -hmm. and a soft plastic mm -hmm. paddle tail. I would agree. Um, what is your go-to lures for, for wade fishing? So, you know, please interrupt me at any time or even if you see a, someone asking a question about this. We get a super chat. We're gonna, we're, I'll, I'll but, time it right. But this could be kind of a very in-depth conversation. So Let's go. The really simple way to answer this, three oh. baits. So you got your top waters, you got your soft plastics, you know, normally a paddle tail on a jig head, and you got your artificial shrimp. So these three baits, I would have to say no matter where you live or what you're trying to fish for, you're going to have success if you invest in those three baits. 
Um, you know, brand preference, I would say, you know, if it sounds good and looks good, buy it. Um, I know this doesn't look like anything that swims in the water, yeah. but uh, yeah, this is a, a color that I'm pretty sure even Josh probably looked at me the and electric said, electric chicken. This you is want me to throw this? Yeah, this, <laughs> yeah this, this catches, this color right here and dirty water catches more fish what was he on? The Drunk Monkey. That, oh, that yeah. color, yeah. You have a monkey color right here? Uh, no, you but, don't have a brown uh, one. But, but the Electric Chicken, this is the go-to color, especially in the Indian River for wade fishing. Yeah. This is my favorite one. And then you start getting into more, you know, natural colors of, you know, browns and greens and, you know, different flakes and these things. I mean, the one and, Josh was and, talking about. By the way, I was going to say also, uh, well, first off, we got a super chat from RSSJ Gamer, so I appreciate that, man. Thank you so much. Um, I've noticed the electric chicken works really good as it gets later in the day. Like like these natural colors mm -hmm. early. Correct. I'm sorry, no, no, I'm sorry. This works better early, and yes. that the low, natural colors get better. Low light. Yes, right. that's what I meant to say. So yeah. what a lot of people probably have learned or maybe heard over the years is water clarity can dictate uh, color options. So for me, you know, again, when I was learning, I always used that as, as a reference. and. I could definitely tell you from experience now that sunlight can dictate a change of color, mm -hmm. not just water clarity. Um, I've been, been out there with you where I'm throwing an electric chicken, I'm not getting any bites, and right. then we switch the color, and it's just right. like every, they were there. Like exactly. You're questioning whether it's fish in front of you. Exactly. And then, you then it's game on. Um, I mean, I want you remind me of the time we were with Robert Fields, and I want to say we were using uh, when were these, we gonna... and he was using uh, Twitch bait. Oh, that's right. And we were wrecking them. <laughs> then he, I think he, he switched over, didn't he? I think so, yeah. yeah. By the way, guys, I just want to let you know, we do have jig heads now, black to page jig heads, on our website at black com. That's what this one's rigged up with right here. What, what are your honest thoughts? I mean, they, 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 you can see the balance they got yeah. right here. No, Check it's a great out, looking Look jig head. I mean, you got your basic yeah, color, top, top your shirt, sure, truce, white, red, you know. Looks Check like a out. very solid hook. It's pretty well balanced. Look at that. Isn't that Stands nice? Stands right up. Look at that. You got a nice barb to hold your rubber baits on. So this is, you know, something me and Josh were talking about before with um, different brand jig heads. When your tie-on... That's your loop. Yeah. When your tie-on is, I don't know how you want to call it, I guess at a 45, you're going to get better action out of your bait compared to if it's right in the front or even right up top. Like some of them... Um, like this for an example, I don't know how well you can see that, but the tie-on comes right off the front. Yeah. Where on a um, on the jig head, where the hell did it go? On the jig head, it's a little more upward facing. Mm -hmm. So why that's important is when you go and put your rubber bait. And actually, here this is a kind of a simple conversation, but a lot of people kind of screw this up. So. Let's see how many people get this right. Is that right? Or is that right? For those of you that said that's right. I'm, I'm actually a little confused right now. What are, what are we? All right, so what we're looking at is top and bottom. Okay. All right, so when you're looking at Oh, it, you mean, yes, yes. So when, okay. you, when, yeah, you yeah, rig yeah. Your, when you rig your bait, you yeah. want to know. You want to know what's, what's, what's up and what's down. What's top and bottom, yeah, yeah, yeah. correct. Because I, I thought really, you were talking about like how much you stretch the bait. No, no, no. So there's, there's plenty of. Total you know, bonehead thing yeah, in there. there. There's plenty of brands and, you know, all different shapes and sizes. But if you just look at it, you can tell that there's a belly to that bait. Mm -hmm. You know, so, you know, the belly should be on the bottom. So when you go and rig it. You go and take your jig head, center it up, you know, just kind of run it down, keep it nice and straight, and uh, pretty simple. Have it come out the middle, and just like that, we are rigged on a black tip H jig head. There it is. Nice. By the way, I need, to, I need to give you some jig head to test out. Yes, please. Yeah. They look very nice. I like them. They rigged up this bait good, too. Hand painted. I like the, it. The, um... So I've caught most of my fish right there on the electric chicken. Someone in the chat, I did see um, all white. I mean, you can't all white. And, yeah. and, and in any situation, a white lure, it's just white bait. You know, there's white bait in fresh water, there's white bait in salt water, there's white bait everywhere. You know, so white bait is universal color. Same thing with black. Totally. You know, like at night, I've noticed, especially when I was uh, I did a lot of musky fishing, 
we would use all black lures, you know, and the silhouette with the moonlight mm -hmm. really got them going. Totally. You know, they see that all black. So you, you just, you touched on something that I'll kind of, I used to do. I'm, I don't really do it as much anymore, but I did kind of build an opinion on this. Um, for those of you who own a bunch of topwaters, look in your tackle box and tell me which one of your topwaters has a black belly. Pretty sure you're gonna find that none of them do. Why? Good question. So do you majority, paint Majority, yes. You I, paint, used to, you... I used to spray paint it. I used to spray paint the bottom black. Why? For the reason you just said about the silhouette. Yeah, there you go. So they do make lures that are obviously all black, but think about this for increasing your odds of seeing your bait and then increasing your odds of the fish seeing your bait. So you got the black belly, and let's just say a white top. So you yeah. buy an all white top water and paint the belly. So now you got visual for you and that black belly for the visual of the fish looking up at the bait. So mm. you're increasing your very odds. Very good, very good, very good. You know, tremendously by doing a little customization to your top waters. Did you actually notice that much of a difference when you did that? When I fished brighter sunlight. When so do you, still, do you still do that? Do you paint, paint the belly? If I find myself fishing brighter sunlight. Yeah. But normally, I'm probably going to be going to something like this when I have the brighter sunlight. Yeah. So, you know, it, it's not to say these won't work, but let's say you're on a topwater bite mm -hmm. and all of a sudden it shuts down and it got real bright. So you could change your top water to the one that has the black belly and keep doing what you're doing and now they see yeah. your bait better. So when, when, when would you want to switch to a shrimp? Like I've, I've noticed when we were out there sometimes we, we switch off, we put a shrimp yep. on there and, the, and we just start smoking them. So the problem with this, the shrimp is you don't get as good as it casts. Correct. You know, you and know. When, when you're fishing a shrimp, you got to have, uh, you got to think of the term slow and low. Um, when I'm out there, you know, sometimes things just come to me or, and you know, you're, you could be catching fish on one bait and go to change to another bait and you might be catching a different species. Um, I, I could honestly say that happened for me with one of my biggest trout ever. What, which one? I don't know if you ever heard this story. So I'm throwing something like this, okay, I want to say it was August or July when this happened. Um, out is with this a couple, couple buddies, um, oh, this is the Justin story. and Corey. They can validate um, the fish. Totally, totally. I have actually a little clip on YouTube of it. Um, this is the giant? Yeah. So the fish was out in the open, and my buddy was missing bites. I was throwing a shoreline catching fish. My buddy's giving me a hard time because I'm catching fish and he's not. So I, being a little bit of a smart beep, tied on what he was using and started talking smack and saying, I'll catch that fish that you can't catch. And wouldn't you know, I tied on shrimp. a DOA shrimp after my good old faithful. Yep. And I caught a 14 pound sea trout. That was 30. 14 pounds? That was 36 inches. So when, 14 you, pounds. when you start the world record, which you guys can look up. 17 pounds? 17, I want to say four. 17 pounds, four you ounces. Do you have a picture of this fish? Mm, I, I'm not on um, Oh, yeah, I do in my phone. Um, 14 you pounds. Can, you can go and understand better when you, when you catch these big sea trout that these big sea trout actually hunt little sea trout. Oh, yeah. Okay, so even if you're, like, let's say you're around small schooling fish and you're just, you know, I'm bored, all these little fish, all these little fish. Perfect example, me, you, and Jay, when you lost your fish, we mm. were catching those little lady fish. Yeah. And you hooked your, you're like, this ain't no lady fish. And you had that big, that big trout. So, Oof. you know, yeah, don't, you, don't you, remind me, bro. You kind of, you know, you just kind of never know. I mean, if, if you don't want to get those small bites or you don't want to catch those small fish, upsize you know use bigger bigger baits um i have caught plenty of big ones on a doa shrimp or really oh, any peanuts, any shrimp i mean every I mean, fish that swims out there will eat the shrimp the so. last the last seminar we did was swordfish seminar and we we're dropping baits this big for something that could weigh six seven hundred pounds right 
You know, and I mean, you could st- stuff a five gallon bucket right. down their throat, but they're eating a little bait. Right. You know, they're just hungry. Fish are hungry. Totally. You know, when they're hungry, they're gonna eat. I elephants. Mean, elephants eat peanuts, gentlemen. Yes. And ladies. So when when would you? I've noticed when we go wade fishing, a lot of times we'll throw top waters in the morning, and we mm-hmm. switch off, and then we go to, we go to uh, jig head, and then mm-hmm. maybe some DOA shrimps. Mm-hmm. Do you always start off with a top water? I like skitter walk some of that. Uh, I'd have to say no. Um, times where I wouldn't want to, you know, going back to the wind, let's say it was too windy, or uh, the weatherman gave the wrong forecast, which we all know he's good at doing that. Um, you know, you he's go to your... He's a professional at doing that. So you can go to your area and, you know, realize the wind's different or the conditions are different, and now you got to switch it up and, you know, throw different things. So I would say if, if it's too choppy, I won't throw it. Um, if the water has really chilled off and is, has a chill to it, I normally won't throw it. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd have to say if I'm fishing on the backside of a front, I'm not going to throw it. Um, other than that, I mean, I would take one topwater blow up off of, other than, you know, five of these hits below the water any day of the week. So yeah, yeah. I'm kind of addicted to that topwater blow up. I'm sure I mean, you, you are too. You can't, you can't beat it. can't beat <laughs> you it. You know. Someone did ask, um, I just see it here. I, yeah, I think this is really relevant to so finding fish. They want to know where the redfish go in the winter. I'd say deeper. You really? know, like... So, depending on how cold you're, you're explaining, from my area in general of the Indian River Lagoon, it's, it's not a very deep body of water. So, mm-hmm. when you are walking or even in your boat, it's very important to always check the depth. Um, sometimes this much difference in depth can, can be life or, or, you know, just black and white. Um, the plus of the wade fishing is... When you're on the bow of your boat and you're going down a flat, you're mm-hmm. not necessarily reading all these little contours that are helping you like understand why this area is a good area. Yeah. You know, you could go somewhere and catch a bunch of fish and say this is a great area. You could literally walk into a sunken log and Correct. trip and go, that's where the fish are. Correct. Correct. You know, a depth change, a piece of structure. Yeah. Anything. I mean, sometimes I mean even offshore, I'm pretty sure you've seen fish on bucket lids. You know, I've I seen mean, a lot of fish on any, bucket lids. Anything <laughs> that's unnatural, fish like to be curious. Yeah. And swim up to it and hang out around it and use it as they a like to hang piece out. of structure, you know. Yeah. So um yeah, I mean when you when you're wade fishing, you're you're kind of a piling in a way, you know, when you're just standing there. So there's been plenty of times where I'm fishing and something tells me to look down and I see a fish just swimming in the water right next to me, and I'm over here trying to catch the fish, and it's right here. So that's also a beauty of, of wade fishing is the, the stealthiness and the quietness of just being out there and no trolling motor and no slapping of the hull of the water, you know. I mean, just... I do have a question right now, though. Yeah. Have you done, I know one of the other most popular ways of wade fishing besides, you know, going inshore and saltwater mm-hmm. is... Trout fishing in streams. Yeah. Have you done that yet? No, I can't say I have. I mean, ironically, the people I took this morning, they actually come from that background. So they're yeah. they're big into stream fishing, but never did, like, open water wade wading. Yeah, yeah. So as, as much as they're both wade fishing, I would say that they're complete opposites. You know, stream fishing, rushing water, yeah. open water, not rushing water. So that can be total opposite. We, we did a little stream fishing when we were up in, um, we actually did a video doing that. We were in uh, Milwaukee. Alaska? Er- Eric oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We are catching uh, rainbows and browns. Beautiful and fish, too. Dude, you gotta go do that. Those are so beautiful. Oh my gosh, dude. It reminded me of big 30-inch gator sea trout down yeah. there. Yeah. see those big browns. Dude, that's oh, dude. freaking cool. So, next question is, do you ever throw a spoon? Uh, for me, I'm gonna have to say no. Now, um, why? So, it's it's kind of basic. It's too, um, it's too basic for you? you? In a way, because, you but know... But sometimes this, this is what you need. Oh, no, uh, like 100%. Like a run, 100%. Dude. So... Do you always carry a spoon with you or no? Yes. So you always bring a spoon with you, but you never use it? Yes. Wow. So, 
I'm gonna explain why. So it's kind of a very simple word called confidence. Yeah, no, I know, I know. So as much as I know it works and it catches fish and you know it's not gonna rip or tear or whatever, when you believe in something, you believe in something. So, yeah. you know, you gotta throw what you believe in, guys. I mean, this color that me and Josh were just talking about, I did definitely did not start throwing this color. I started with more natural colors or even more whites. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as I'm, you know, just building my fishing knowledge, I would experiment with colors. And where am I going with this conversation? So it had to do with, you know, darks and brights. That's the simplicity of the conversation of this is bright, this is dark. Yeah. Is the fish really eating it because it's pink or it's purple or brown or whatever, or just because it's bright or dark? So like, like, I'll be honest, man. Like a lot of people, red fishing, mm -hmm. gold spoon. Yeah, I mean, going going back to the to the redfish conversation. Yeah. So the redfish, I mean, there's not a lot of deep water in the Indian River Lagoon. So bridges and jetties and things like that. That's where your deep water is. So if you're on the flat and let's say you are catching redfish and you get a cold front, where's the closest deep water? You know, and that could be a two foot depth change, a five foot depth change. You don't necessarily need to just be driving and all of a sudden the depth finder, you know, dumps off and you're going, this is the spot. Um, yeah. You know, sometimes just very, very small indications will give you reasons to start fishing the area. Um, going back to the wade fishing and boat fishing, when you're boat fishing, the, the engine doesn't allow you to fish thorough because if you're fishing an area and you're not catching fish you're probably pressing go on the boat and going really far in some direction mm -hmm. if you're not catching fish when you're waiting you're forced to walk and and figure yeah. out where the fish are and sometimes just changing baits yeah um i want to interrupt you for one sec cliffy another uh, super chat here guys he just said just answer your question we love them. our marlin pb black marlin 1100 pounds in Kenya, also fly fish for GTs and permit. Dude, I'm coming. Like, hmm. you know, you can't keep talking about thousand pound marlin and GTs <laughs> and permit without me going. Yeah, I want to come there. Ah, <laughs> oh, I hate COVID, dude. So this year we were supposed to travel. I know I keep saying this, but all around the world. And sadly, that's not going to happen. Um, and 2021 isn't looking too <laughs> too hopeful right now. So mm. hopefully, Lord willing, things get better and. We, uh, we can travel again because we need to travel. Yes, we really need to get out there and explore new fisheries. We know we've, I'll be honest, one of the things that's been a huge struggle for us this year is trying to find new content that we haven't filmed yet in Florida. Hmm. And it's, it's becoming a real challenge. Yeah. Because we've done hundreds of videos in Florida and it's really, really hard for us to find out what we want to film now. Like mm -hmm. there's always something new going on. There's always something unique that always happens. It's, it's Florida. It's fishing capital of the world, but you know, um, you know, loss of habitat, water quality, you know, bait depreciation. I mean, not depreciation, bait just disappearing. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's gotten a lot harder and harder every year. So, oh, definitely. you know, it's not, it's, it's definitely our content this year. I was hoping a lot to give you guys a lot more. But you know what? This is where these live streams came. That's where a lot of new content has, has, has kind of given birth to itself because we're always trying to find a new way. And I figured that's why we got Jason here today. You know, we want to you know, answer your questions and, and talk about things that just want to help make you guys better fishermen. So that's why I'm trying to, you know, see what I what I can ask Jason because Jason's been doing this longer than anybody I know. That's, this is his passion. This is what he loves to do. He, he loves 100%. putting the waders on. Get into the water 100%. and catching fish. 100%. And his favorite fish to catch is sea trout. 100%. I mean, this guy, if you, if, okay, I'm going to ask you another question. If you could catch a thousand pound marlin or a 15 pound gator trout, which one are you taking? <laughs> I'm pretty sure you know that answer. Because, I mean, that's like a huge spectrum there, and I would love to catch a marlin. But to catch the biggest sea trout that ever lived, I mean, I'm kind of getting twitchy just talking about it, but... That's your dream come true? It would, yeah. It would really, like, feel good to know that... And, and I feel like the record is going to have a 2.20-something. Do you think there's a 20-pound trout? Come on. 
whether it's in this area that I live in or it's in, you know, the biggest Titusville or Fort it's Pierce, somewhere Texas, in Fort Pierce, Vero. Whatever. Nah, it's, it's here somewhere. So the world record right now comes from Fort Pierce. Yeah. Um, and I think the lot of records before Te- were, were Texas Vero, right? got a lot of big sea trout. I'm not really? going to lie. Texas got a lot of big sea trout. Are you serious? A lot of big sea trout. Have you been trout. there yet? No, but I follow a lot of people on social media that are from Texas. And man, they got some beautiful sea trout over there. Really? Um, yeah, we do some sea trout in Texas. So... You know, a couple years ago, before we had a lot of the trout die, or not the trout die off, the grass die off, the trout fishing, I would say, was phenomenal. You know, it's it's not that it's horrible, but it's definitely harder. And what makes it harder is the loss of habitat. So I'm imagine a, if you had to drive 10 miles to get a sandwich, or you had to drive two minutes to get a sandwich. The water quality issues, and this is a whole nother video, but the water quality issues in Florida is reaching critical mass. I mean, yeah. it, 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 it is bad. It's really, 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 really bad. Um, what the what I have seen, now I haven't lived here my whole life. I've been fishing in Florida since 2003. But what I have seen since I've started coming here, since I've been in Florida, the fishery has, and people say it cycles. I, 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 that's a pretty big cycle. Yeah, it's yeah, it's too big. So I, I think the reality is, is if we don't fix this water quality soon, I, I think we could see the loss of our entire fishery. Not, you know, it's I not, hope. it's not just the water quality. It's also our bait. Like one of the things I'm really, really passionate about is preserving our bait, mm-hmm. and we have depleted our bait to near extinction. I mean, it's. It can be very I mean, hard to sardines find sardines offshore. I don't remember There's, sardines showing I, up. I remember seeing in sardine schools, they get five football fields. Hundred percent giants, endless 100%. sardines, thirty feet thick of sardines. As, as many mm-hmm. you couldn't catch them all if you wanted to. And then, you know, you started seeing it in recent years with the frozen sardines. You would, they were you couldn't get frozen frozen Florida sardines. They were mm-hmm. getting them from China, mm-hmm. and they and those ones always sucked. Mm-hmm. You know, and now they're getting them from Indonesia. Are, are, you know, you got to pay premium dollar for a Florida sardine, a frozen, a frozen Florida sardine. But it's it's getting harder and harder every year. I mean, it's different. You know, the bait gets highly concentrated, and people whack them. But like like this past year, we found a spot. Davis and I were we were whacking them. We were whacking them. Greenies, but, uh, pilchards, oh. just crushing them, dude. And um, there was there were greenies there too. There was all kinds of bait there. But mm. dude, there were commercial guys there every day, endless. Net netting just nonstop, and you know it's not the commercial that guys' fault; it's the demand. You know, there's a huge demand for these fish, and they're just trying to make a living. And correct. that's, you know, our, our bait. I've seen the, the pogey boats from up north in the Chesapeake. Wow, that is, I don't. You, yeah. you haven't been up there, dude. It, it, no. It's desolate. I mean, there it, used well, to be so many more bunker there. You remind me of my childhood of snagging bunker. So yeah. you see bunker cast in the river, netting right? wasn't really a thing. Yeah. I'm going to kind of sound old right now, but when I was younger, 25 years, 30 years ago is when I was living up north, um, snagging bunker was how we caught the bunker. We didn't yeah. need cast net. Cast yeah. netting wasn't really a thing. So once cast netting became a thing, I mean, I wasn't living there, but imagine how much more bait and easier it is to get the bait than to one by one be snagging it. I mean, think about if we had to go snag mullet or cast net mullet. Yeah. I mean. I You know what? I'll be honest, though. When, when it comes to mullet run, my favorite thing to do is snag mullet. So I carry I carry a triple hook rod and I carry a live bait rod yeah. because you just can't. They don't can't, always come close no, enough. No, but you, you can't ca- carry a cast net, a bucket, an aerator. Too. It's just it's too much. That you need too. To be, Agree. You need to be very light, mm-hmm. lean, and just keep. Because those schools move. Mm-hmm. They're moving fast. you gotta, you got to be very efficient. You can't. And that's also, time. you know, going back to waiting. I mean, traveling light, you know, having, I mean, my, real quick, I want to grab, you know, like this rod. This is your, your black tip H rod. This is our, so, new, our new split grip rod. Yeah, I mean, this is a 6 to 12, 7 foot rod, you know, split grip, nice, nice feel, nice pop. One thing I look for when I'm, when I'm buying a rod is, I want to put it in my hand, and I kind of want to pop the back of it here mm-hmm. and really understand what that tip is doing. So when I'm going to make a cast, yeah, I can really understand that 
that action. But I like this feel. Don't don't mean to sound sales right now, but that rod, I think, I think it retails for one fifty nine ninety nine. But that's very affordable. No, no, check this out. That thing has a lifetime warranty. Even better. You know, Even like better. a lot of a lot of manufacturers, they they got rid of that. You know, and it, it kind of bothered me because yeah. that was and then you got like this, stand behind your product. Yeah, you know? and you got this other. This one. thing's bad of the bone. So this, this is your this is, this is your carbon one, one right? Yeah. Better guides, carbon back. The reason why I put the carbon here is how many times have you hooked a fish that's too big for your rod? This is a six twelve pound rod, and you wish you had a little more backbone. Yeah. That's this stiffens up the blank. Yeah. And prevents that from happening. Yeah. I mean, you can see, you know, in the front here where you got nice action. Kind yeah. of the middle is the, you know, and then it really stiffens up at the back end. And for this to be, like you said, a 6 to 12 and have that good kind of popping action. You like that, eh? I mean, I could throw the top waters. I could throw the jig. I could throw the shrimp. It's a very, very versatile feeling rod. You know, and I built it so it's 7 foot. So when I was in the Bahamas, we were, uh, I was fishing for bonefish and muddins. And we were using these things right here. These, uh, these things were mm -hmm. killers. You put a little curly tail on that and it's game over. But I tried using my 7.6. Mm rod and I it, it wore me down because mm. you're casting so many times mm -hmm. so like the seven foot I found is just much more ergonomic it's gonna mm -hmm. that little bit if you if you have too much weight in that in that rod it will make you tired you so gotta make it light as possible you're actually touching on something that I've, I've tried to do over the last couple of years which is shave weight off of my rods and reels mm -hmm. and I mean when you're throwing lures for hours sometimes you shave off a couple ounces of your rod and reel your arms and shoulders and back and everything will thank you because yeah I mean when I first started wade fishing I was fishing 30 pound braid Ooh, and yeah. seven six now you use 10 pound 12, braid, right? 20 rod and mm. You know, I was wondering why my buddies were all out casting me, and I downsized my line, downsized my leader, went to lighter action rods, and now there's probably not a time where someone picks up my gear that goes fishing with me and is, you know, impressed by how well the gear casts because of the light, light line, light action poles, and, you know, when you hook a big fish on small tackle, it is super fun. <laughs> you know, I mean, I know Josh likes to rip lips off, but... uh well, you know, I like to it's enjoy it sometimes too. Yeah, no, no, no. I love enjoying it too. But like, you know, I mean, my favorite thing with fishing is I like to get them away from the sharks. No one that that too. But but <laughs> I, but I I really I like to be me versus the fish. So I like to feel the power of the fish. Mm. That just makes me that makes me happy. Totally. You know, but like I also love hooking. Uh, dude, I'll sit there and catch bluegills. I don't care. I want to catch oh, anything. Totally. Dude. I just want to feel a bend in the if, rod, man. Yeah, if you're addicted to fishing, you don't care what you're fishing. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty sure there was a video of you not that long ago. Maybe it was a little old, a while ago where I think you were snook fishing. Maybe it was with Scott Martin. And some ladyfish showed up. And you were like, ooh, I want to catch a ladyfish. And I was just like, yeah, yeah I love that's Josh. <laughs> like, I love catching ladyfish. He fish, just man. loves fishing. <laughs> yeah. No, dude, seriously, like, I know this sounds absolutely crazy. But I don't get to catch, for some reason, I've never caught that many ladyfish in my life. <laughs> I mean, I have caught a lot of them, but I haven't caught, like, as much as I've wanted to. Uh -huh. So, like, when I get a chance to get, like, a big old ladyfish, like, oh, yeah. gets me going. Oh, yeah. Because they're yeah. like little tarpon, man. They're Definitely. so much fun. Definitely. Dude, Back. honestly, if you could say, Josh, we're going to go wade fishing tomorrow, and there's giant 40-inch ladyfish, <laughs> I, I, I would be, I'd drop everything. Game on. There. Yeah, I'd be there. I'd be, I'd be there stacked. <laughs> I, 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 if, if, I mean, a 40-inch ladyfish is giant, but, like. I'd be there all day, bro. I mean, dude, we were getting, I remember a couple years ago, we were getting 10 pounders mm. from the jetty. Giants, I've bro. caught some like, big ones. We were talking big, about Sebastian giant. earlier. I probably have caught my biggest ladyfish at Sebastian How Inlet. Big? 34 inches. Wow. Eight pounds, maybe. I don't know. I mean, it was a, what I thought was a small tarpon until it, you know, got in real close. And I was like, holy crap, they're hard that's to catch, a ladyfish? Too. They're hard to catch. They spit. Oh, yeah. They're very no, good they're at spitting very, the hook. very, very good at doing that. They have that violent kind of head shake Dude, like a trout, trout. Trout are great at spitting the hook, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they are. So, like, going back to wade fishing, because, mm -hmm. you know, I remember when you guys warned you about these, these rabbit holes we're going to go down. <laughs> um, that, that's why I was one of them. Um, so... You know, we're talk we talked about spoons, we talked about top waters. When do you do you ever use a popping cork? Yeah. Um, you know, it's it's again, it's kind of a basic way to fish, but there's actually quite a few ways to fish a popping cork with a lure. 
Um, you do you get know. more distance in your cast with that. That's, that's yes. a huge yes. plus. Um, you know, I, I do want to touch on this for casting reasons. Um, when you start casting a pop and cork and a lure, you got two different weights. So you'll get this type of cast. Yeah. Or cast. if you can, what, what's called a punch cast, where you can really just kind of rifle it and throw it and get the weight of the cork to kind of have the, your leading. One of the things I found these extremely effective with is Spanish mackerel. Yeah. When you want to throw yes. little, little spoons. Yeah, yeah. Because you just can't cast a little spoon to the wind. But put little, back. little, uh, what do you call those things? Yeah. Little mylar jigs Ooh. and, you know, things Game like on. that. Yeah. Um, I mean, just about anything. I mean, there's plenty of people who do this. I don't do it as much, but use a cork when you're tarpon fishing. You know, maybe not a, a, a rattling cork or a popping cork, but that's the difference. I don't have a regular cork here, but this right here is the cork. So if this wasn't attached, it's still a float. But why you want to use this is because it comes with brass beads or plastic beads, and it'll make a noise, which is going to be an indicator for the fish to find your lure or your bait. Yeah. Um, you know, shrimp, pinfish, small mullet. Obviously, a lot of these lures, I mean, you wouldn't really rig up your top water on the Why not? popping cork. Hey, I mean, dude, you know it what? might be something that we don't dude, know about. Dude, but. I'm going to tell you straight up, bro. Um, when it comes to fish, one thing I've learned is, yeah, you know, I don't mean, obviously, really not really an upside down <laughs> in that. But, like, dude, if you're, you're just getting dub, dub, double noise, you know? I mean, I'm not saying I'm going to go do it, but, like, there might be a situation where that might, have, that might work. So you, you kind of just touched on something that going through the memory bank. So I've been there at a bridge, okay, on a, on a shadow line yeah. where the fish are blowing up and I can see the fish mm -hmm. and I'm throwing top water and they want nothing to do with it. So then normally I'm going to go to an artificial shrimp. Yeah. Throwing the artificial shrimp, they want nothing to do with it. I took the top water, mm -hmm. tied it on. Tied on maybe this much leader. I don't know what's that, 15 inches? Tied on the shrimp to an extra leader right here. I throw the top water with the shrimp attached. I'm reeling the top water. So now this is at a controlled depth yep. as it's coming through the shadow line. Mm -hmm. First cast, bang. So it wasn't it wasn't falling natural, it wasn't on the surface. It was just below the surface, riding at a very particular part of the water column. And I'll never forget it because it was one of those moments, like you just said, where oh my why not until you try it? I mean, the people that were at the bridge that night, I'm pretty sure they were going, what is this guy doing? Yeah. And then once it worked, I'm well, pretty sure they were digging for a topwater and a You, and you a know what's interesting is um, I've had this is gonna sound crazy. So when, you know, sometimes your live bait dies or that, or your, one thing I'll do when I'm offshore is I'll take like a blue runner or a goggle eye and mm -hmm. I'll, I'll butterfly from the back. I'll leave, I won't take the tail part off. Mm -hmm. I'll leave it in there, okay? And I'll put a weight, I'll put a knocker rig on there with some wire and I'll troll them around mm -hmm. and they'll swim like Interesting. this. Interesting. You know, and I've caught fish doing that, you know, hmm. where you get, you get, dude, sailfish will hit it, everything will hit it, man. Really you know, like, there's never, if you can create a good presentation, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter how it looks out of the water, mm -hmm. it matters how it looks in the water. And if you can use things to make a good presentation, you're problem solving, you're getting the job done. Yeah, and I mean, and, also going back to what we were talking about with just believing. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you have to believe what you're doing is right. Yeah, you cannot. But there's many times. Bring it up and out of the hour. Well, see, see, here, here's the here's the truth though, right? That's true, but a lot of times when I go to these different countries or these different places and fish with these different people yeah, and do something I mean, I've never sure done before, I have zero confidence in what they're doing. Like, <laughs> Correct. And that's why I just go, let's see how you do this. Right, I want right. to, I want to learn. Right. Show me how you do this. And I'm, I ask a million questions. Probably annoy people sometimes, and uh, you know, but you know. I want to. I want to know. You know, and and then I take those techniques and go. How can I apply those techniques to what I've learned Agreed. in Florida? Agreed. What I've learned in my own backyard? And that's that's a secret of fishing. It's like yeah. you have to be humble enough to learn, and you have to be eager enough to ask. Yeah, and you, know? you got to be able to be, be able to put your own twist on it. You know, for the viewers yeah. that are watching this, these are our opinions. These are things we've learned. 
You yeah. know, it doesn't always mean every time out we're going to catch fish or these ways are always going to work. What you're learning today, use your own twist on it, yeah. you know? Hey, now, 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 okay, so of all the lures here, what would you use? Oh, well, first off, how often do you catch flounder while wade fishing? Uh, I'd say flounder can be somewhat of a bycatch just because they're going to be big ones. They're going to be a bottom dweller. Um, biggest flounder wading, I would say seven pounds. It's a freaking nice I flounder, mean, man. You Jeez. know, when when you're when you do have a flounder, it's kind of a very distinct, almost like when you have a stingray. It kind of feels like it's stuck. Yeah. Um, but flounder, you know, they'll they'll do that, but then they'll come up and they'll they'll shake. Did you, you know, want something crazy? So. We, were, we were trolling at five miles an hour in Nantucket mm. with with a you know a, a swim a swim uh, lure crankbait whatever you want to call it, mm. and a flounder ate it on the on the troll. He came up and smoked it. Wow, it was crazy. Wow, like, uh, I mean, perfect example. You won't know unless you. <laughs> yeah, I was like that. I, I was like, did that really just happen? Right. Like, I didn't know that was even possible. Yeah. So, uh, flounder fishing. I just want to talk about because like flounder's yeah. a fish that. I really haven't had much, much interaction with. I really want to pursue them more. I was trying to this year. The weather, weather wasn't as good as I was hoping for, but um, South Florida. Not it's to tough. Interrupt, you gotta yeah. go north. You gotta go north. A little more north. I mean, yeah. Sebastian North. It's probably easier. Sebastian needs to be better. awesome. Sebastian needs to be awesome. And we then we started gigging them all, mm. killed them all. Mm. <laughs> no. I, but have you seen? Here's here's where I was leading to. Did you see more flounder back in the day here when there was when, grass? When there was grass. Uh, I'm going to have to say no. So, flounder tend to like sand. I mean, there'll be plenty of times where they're going to hang out on a grass flat, but they're, I would say, more comfortable in sand because yeah. if you've ever seen one in a tank, they'll, you know, they'll kind of, like, do, like, a shimmy yeah. and, like, throw sand over themselves yeah, yeah, yeah. from their side there's, pins. There's more offshore now. That's where we find them. Gotcha. On the wrecks. So less grass, more yeah. sand. So if you're out on the flat and let's say you get these sand holes, you know, grasses around it and then the sand holes. So as much as there could be trout and redfish and everything else sitting in the sand holes, mm -hmm. I would say that could be more of a prime zone for a flounder than just in that grass. Because when he wants to bury, yeah. he's got all that grass to go through. Compared to the sand, he can just naturally, you know, kind yeah, of bury right. and no, hide you're right. and you're right. ambush. It makes so. a lot of sense. So, actually, one thing we kind of missed on, what size jig head? You know, we got right here, we, uh, these ones, we got a yeah. quarter, three-eighth, one-eighth, and one-sixteenth. What size jig head do you normally use for wading? Because you're so, obviously chest deep, Yeah, right? so so quarter are, right, ounce. Um, quarter ounce is probably my most favorite. Um, quarter I, ounce? I'd have to say ounce, a lot of people right? throw an eighth. You know, they're, they're so worried ounce, about getting in the grass and, and things like that. So... It's a little bit based on your area, how much grass you have or how, how deep your water is. But I really prefer a quarter ounce because it'll also help me get more distance sometimes uh -huh. than the person who's throwing an eighth ounce. Um, the very uh, sharp, I hate to touch on this, but I think this is going back to the waiting with Robert thing. When, when we were fishing this, this has a very quick, yeah, you know, where the twitch bait that I think he was using is a is a glide. Yeah. You know, compared to a very erratic Fish are like squirrels. Twitch. They're like me. You know, they, they go <laughs> Did you say something? Did you say something? <laughs> what? Mullet? Ladyfish? Lion fish? Huh? No, they are. Like Marlin? Like, what? Yeah. So you gotta think like a fish, you know, you gotta be like sporadic, you know, like Oh, totally. And like they want to. They they like to chase. They want to they wanna go after something. See we we as humans we have the ability to pick this thing up and go, I don't want that fish have to bite it yeah exactly. and then they're hooked yeah so <laughs> they don't have the option to say you know oops i made a bad decision yeah no no <laughs> or where we could go yeah i don't want that i'm gonna drop it <laughs> you know what i mean so you know when when it fishing, is true they got they got they got to use their mouth yeah i mean you know, we, we sometimes, and I know I'm guilty of it, we'll overthink, you know, things where 
just tying on a good old spoon and firing it out there. I mean, I was... I've caught more fish on spoons than anything. Well, I was going to touch on this one before when go we were talking to about a spoon. Go lure. So, right I don't know if it still is, but I remember back in the day, my grandfather always told me when he went into the Army, he had a survival kit. Mm-hmm. And the, the Army gave him a silver spoon in his survival kit. Now, if you think about that, why? You know... Why? But it it's right there in front of you. It's metal. It's not going to des- get destroyed. It's yeah. shiny. Every bait fish is shiny. Yeah. I mean, look at, you know. So when you're throwing a spoon, whether it's a largemouth bass, I mean, I don't know about a black marlin, but everything will eat a spoon. Saltwater, freshwater, two foot of water, 220 feet of water. Everything's gonna eat a spoon out. It's like a burger shake, you know. So, all right. So here's what we're gonna do. We we've covered we've covered how to find fish. We've covered how to rig baits. What our favorite baits are. Mm-hmm. I say we open the floor now. We ask you guys ask whatever questions you want about wade fishing. Let's keep it to wade fishing. You know, mm-hmm. I know we could ask everything. Um, we could. I'll answer a few non-wade fishing questions, but mostly wade fishing questions. That's what I want to. Uh, you know, you guys ask. I do want to touch on this top water stuff. Yeah, let's quick, talk yeah. about that first, actually. Okay. Yeah, okay. That, 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 that we, yeah, we we did miss that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So the reason why me and Josh kind of laid out all these different ones is um, obviously size, color, um, you know, maybe brand or price, whatever, but. One main thing that you guys, ladies, need to figure out is the sound of it. So a lot of Here, baits... Let's put it right up to the microphone. Hold on, right? There's that one. Give me a different one. Put it right up here. Put it right, right, right this, the mic. This is a great different sound. Yeah. So this should sound way different. And there's this one. Now get this. Big old top water, right? It's probably going to be loud, right? No, there's nothing in that. So understand that we just picked up three top waters that sound completely different. Yeah. You know, and you're probably going, well, why? Why would I want that? Why not that? So this is going to come down to pressured fish, cleaner water, overcast skies. Um, so you know, you there's want not more a noise or, or less noise. More noise with more bait? Well, so it's kind of like this. I would say the more bait, the the less the less this. So you right. don't want rattle if there's no, more bait. This. See how high pitch that is? Yeah. It's like it almost like it has BBs. Yeah. It's a very loud lure. See how that has like a knock? Yeah. But also BBs? Where are we doing yeah, this one right here? Yeah. See how that sounds like no BBs, but yeah. just a knock. Yeah. So when you're working your top water, there's a technique called walking the dog. So the walking the dog is getting that noise. You know, so that's how you're going to realize when you're working it, you know, whether it's too loud or too quiet or whatever the whatever the case may be. You know, um, some scenarios of dirty water or overcast sky, louder, louder could be better, you know. So, do you feel, like, honestly, I'm just going to say this honestly, like, I feel like... It doesn't matter. No, it does, but I feel like, like, honestly, like, when you listen to this thing, right, Mm -hmm. like, you have to actually... What does that sound like? You know what it sounds like? Well, it sounds like a lot of tails. This sounds like, it sounds like a tail. You know, like, like, it's, like, it's, a, like a more natural A more noise. natural, like, 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 you know, having a bunch of BBs in there, it just Correct. sounds like there's, it's not, like See, what sounds, you know, like, but, like, like you have to make it, like, what is it making sounds like in the water, you know? It's a good question, but what what is going on here really that I think a lot of people just maybe know, maybe don't know? It's, it's allowing the, the lure manufacturers to say, well, we own this and we own this. Ooh, what is, what is that? Yeah. So now it falls into the category well, the problem, we won't the problem know the... unless we buy it yeah, and yeah, try yeah. it. Sure. But then we're going to go, 
what are we at a, at a margarita? Ask me how many fish hey, I've hey, hey, Ask me how many fish I've caught in that lure. This one? Zero? Yeah. Yeah, ask me how many fish I've caught. How many fish you've caught in this lure? A lot. That's why it's all beat up. Millions. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> that answers that question. Okay, um, moving on. Yeah. So honestly, um, yeah, and, you know, I'll just be straight up with you guys, because why not? You know, so uh a lot of manufacturers are selling anglers, not fish. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Just just, just buy something that that's very functional. You yeah. know, don't buy something because it looks cool and it costs a lot of money because it probably doesn't really do much to fit. One of the greatest lures of all time is a cedar plug. Mm -hmm. It's a piece of wood <laughs> with a lead and a hook, and I it's not a, painted. It's the pretty, same color as this table. I have a pretty funny and story it about that. Smokes fish. I've caught yeah. everything on cedar plugs. Very first time going to an efficient, yeah. which I don't do it a lot, but I did some research. I bought all this stuff, and the guy that I went with pulled out a cedar plug. I'm just like, what is this thing? What is this basic piece of wood? You know, I went and bought all this shiny stuff. Yeah. And wouldn't you know the cedar plug did the trick? Dude, that, that thing I went rocks. and must have spent $60 on all kinds of fancy crap, and the, the weighted piece of wood. Yeah. Caught the fish. So, yeah. So, um, we're going to open the floor here for questions here soon, guys, but I, I want to say one more thing. Mm -hmm. um, what I've noticed, and my rule has always been this, guys, um, when it comes to lures, keep it simple. You know, mm -hmm. like, go, you know, like a jig and, jig and a soft plastic, you know, the, you know, if you want to go and buy some giant lifelike lure, I, I, I the lure doesn't have to look exactly like the bait to catch fish. Fish don't are not that detailed. I mean, if they were, we'd all be in big trouble because we wouldn't be catching as many fish as we, th we think look we would. Look what he's holding. You know, Electric chicken. Yeah, there's nothing, so. there's nothing in Florida that looks like that. But yeah. we smoke fish on this thing like you wouldn't believe. Oh, um, you know, so, so just because it looks good and just because it, it might, you know, have a nice price and a nice paint job doesn't mean it's going to catch fish. You know, yeah. so... You gotta, you gotta kind of experiment. Experiment, but also just keep it simple. You know, mm -hmm. just keep it the basics. I mean, like honestly, there's like probably seventeen thousand different soft plastic colors. Easily, I, 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 you know, honestly, like white, black, brown, maybe, maybe a shark shoes I'll and electric greens. chicken. Yeah, there's not many. I mean, and honestly, I'm probably just wearing white, black, and black. Well, you want to know what I find funny, which I also believe in? I didn't hear you mention the word blue. Wow, and yeah. for some odd reason, I don't throw a lot of things blue. I like blue for offshore because of, cause of flying fish and that, but... It, but inshore, not really, what's right? What's blue inshore? I don't know how many of you guys agree with blue lures inshore, but... Maybe if you're fishing in the islands in the Caribbean and that, you know, but even then, you use something white. Right, right, right. You know, like... Listen right here, dude. This in the Bahamas, this crushed it. You know, it looks mm -hmm. like it's got a, it looks a like a shrimp, shrimp, a little crab. Shrimp. Yeah, a little shrimp, a little crab. Match the hatch, but like, I mean, this is clearly not matching the hatch here, mm -hmm. and it crushes. So, Correct. yeah, like you said, just keep trying things out. Don't get too fancy. Keep it simple. You'll catch a lot of fish. All right, mm -hmm. we're gonna open the the folder questions now, guys. So any wade fishing question, any wade fishing questions you may have, ask away. All right. What type of area should I target during the winter months here in Florida, Tampa Bay areas when the water temperature drops below 70 degrees? Honestly, one of my favorite spots there, warm water outflows from power plants. Mm -hmm. That's always a great spot. Um, maybe you can go to deeper water. You know, I don't know the area that well enough, but I was exactly going to say what you just said about outflow. You know, any kind yeah. of pipes that have a good flow you know normally there'll be a, a temperature break there mm -hmm. of some kind and you know sometimes it don't take much you know just a, a degree or so for fish to want to be in that body people are asking about weedless jigs yeah what are your I thoughts got, on that i got a couple right here so i rigged up a you know electric chicken i got this jerk bait um i actually added these eyes to it you know sometimes you can get kind of fancy and Add them or not add them, but the uh, this one particularly, I don't know if that's been very good, but yeah, I mean it just gives it another look, you know. When you um, when you're throwing these baits, a lot of times they don't have eyes, so the jig head itself will be the eye, you know what I mean? And 
you know, you'll see different, you know, different eyes, basic ones, simple ones. As long as the jig head or the bait has an eyeball of some kind. I see we lost an eyeball here. Oh, that, yeah. Where did that thing come from? Oh, probably that rubber bait it fell out of. That Which one? Screwing it. Oh, shit. It fell right off the whole thing. No. Cut. Come on now. Great. Oh, did you glue these on there? No, it actually came like that, but. No, it did it not. It wasn't supposed to fall off like that. It's okay. <laughs> That's, so anyway, why, that's why there's a pack of 20 in there. Yeah. Anyway, about the eyeballs, um, you know, I think it's a very overlooked thing when you're picking a jig head or a bait or something like that. Here's when, why I fell off right there. When, you, um, when you're really, you know, keying in on Do fish why. care about eyeballs? So let me explain why. I mean. I, I feel like they do. I mean. So. Yeah, it's, I, it's a I, silhouette, so I, I seen, can see that. But. I seen a YouTube video. I don't remember the guy's name, but I seen a YouTube video where... This kid, young kid, takes a whopper plopper, right? Mm -hmm. And he takes a whopper plopper and he catches the fish. And he adds a whopper plopper. And every time he caught a fish, he added a bait. He's ended up throwing a whopper plopper like this long. It was like seven baits long. And if you watch the video, every single fish came on the front hook. Really? Explain to me why. I don't know. Because eyeball, it's, eyeball, it's giving it could them. Be, it could be an instinct thing. It giving, it's giving them a target. It's but giving is them. That, but is it an eyeball thing, or is it because they? That's where they know where the, the, he, the head is. Correct, correct. And that's where they know. I'm gonna like correct. a lion that grabs the throat. Correct. And, you know, right. that, that's how I kill. Because that's if you're if thing. you're looking at a bunch of baits connected. And by the way, there's a bunch of eyeballs. He's catching bass, isn't he? Yes. Okay, so bass. See, every fish feeds differently. Like a barracuda, a wahoo, a mackerel, cut they're going to cut the tail off. off. A mako shark, they Correct. cut the tails off. So Correct. each fish feeds differently. A bucket mouth fish Correct. probably will go for the head. Mm -hmm. You know, but... Um, the fish that wants to inhale compared to trying yeah, to injure and then If come you try that trick in where there's a bunch of barracudas, you're going to be losing a lot of lures. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, definitely. Yeah, you know, they're going to bite, bite the tail off. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I've noticed it. I mean, sometimes they grab the head, but they usually go for the tail. Yeah. You no, know? I mean... I just think, you know, sometimes we, when, when we're picking out a bait, it, it just has to scream to us, you know, where sometimes just a little, you know, a, a change of an eyeball or, a, you know, the tie on or something really silly that you would normally never think is really important is, is what I find to be very important. So, so, so Sarah, we're going to take some questions here. Do you recommend hair jigs or swim jigs? Uh, hair jigs to swim jigs. So I'm assuming when you say a swim jig, a rubber bait of some kind. Yeah, I'm sure that's what he means. Um, yeah, this is a hair jig right So here. I'm going to have to say a rubber bait to a hair jig. Uh -huh. um, I, I like the, the hair jig, but... But why not put a little rubber tail on the on, on your hair jig? So that's what you did in the th Bahamas. This might sound minor, but when you got wind in your face, which I find myself fishing a lot of wind in my face, when you're making that punch cast... This is going to cut the wind better than that hair. Yeah. That hair is going to slow down and That's decrease true. True. your distance. So if you're trying to really punch a cast into the wind, you want, you know, minimal yeah. stuff. Makes sense. Um, but it's not to say one is better than the other. You know, I just prefer the paddle tail. The hair jig catches plenty of fish. So Here's a great, great, great question. How do you avoid spooking fish while waiting? It's a great question. How do you avoid spooking fish while waiting? Um, boy, that is a good one. So, if if you are spooking fish while waiting, you, I would say you're doing just a couple things wrong. You're either walking very fast and you're stirring up the bottom, or you're walking very heavy and you're making. So just 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 shuffle shuffle walk glide yeah you know um you know don't you see the prestige in his eyes guys glide <laughs> so you don't want glide. you don't want to you don't want to be you could act well, actually, be I, like water be like mike i want to okay, what? No, no. um so you could be very loud okay like talking loud when i go but wade fishing you i bring firecrackers you that's don't want to be loud below the water that's that's probably the easiest way to 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 help that person is you could be as loud as you want above but don't be 
heavy walking and stomping and trying not to stir up the bottom. Stirring up, yeah, yeah, stirring up the bottom. Next question: Redfish tips while waiting from lures to combos, weather, and what time of year? I remember a lot of redfish. Questions. Redfish is a it's a highly prized wading fish, isn't it? Yeah, I mean it is. I mean whenever you can catch a redfish in any body of water, it's just such a beautiful fish to to catch. Um, you know, snook and and trout and jacks they don't necessarily drum, so when you catch a big redfish and you're hearing them, you know it's like, whoa, what is, <laughs> what's this big guy doing? You know what I mean? So it's really cool to get a big redfish under your belt and. I would say my biggest is probably 35 inches wading and a good 48 from a jetty. So, you know, I would 48 say... 48 from a jetty, what does that mean? 48 inches from oh, a jetty. Oh, yeah, yeah, I think you said 48 inches of water. From no, that, no, so the the 35 inch fish or 34 inch fish was, I don't know, 12 or 13 pounds. What lure did you catch it on? Uh, Actually, I think it was this one. Electric chicken? Mm-hmm. It was a... Um, it was a cold, super windy. Do you find that they bite better? I've, I've noticed redfish down here, they bite a lot better when it's a cold front. They, they turn uh, yeah, on like a light I, switch. I think it has to do with water temp. Yeah. Um, because down in Stewart, there was a good little run for the past couple of years of when the mullet runs here, there was some redfish showing up at some of the bridges and the jetties. And, you know, people were kind of scratching their head going, why are these redfish here? So. I yeah. think it could have just been the, the redfish followed the bait, and, you know, there you got a bunch of redfish. I got a question spot, for you, actually. So. Have you ever caught a triple tail wading? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Not very common, but yeah. Yeah, that makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. some and the what do we caught them on? I want to say more on a shrimp. So, so redfish, do you catch more redfish during the winter months, spring months, fall, or summer? Uh... Bigger, I would no, say. No, no, no. Do you catch cooler? Do you get okay? So you know, no, do you get more fish though? More, I would say, comes in warmer time, but I would say bigger yeah. is normally cooler. Okay. So you could have you know multiple shots of, you know, springtime redfish where wintertime fish normally are just big bulky fish. So. That makes sense. Uh, spooky fish. Okay, let's see your next question. What do you think the best redfish lure is for slot fish? So, I wouldn't say it's my favorite, but if you probably Google that, oh, you're spoon. probably going to get a gold spoon answer. Yeah. So, a gold spoon, no matter where you're fishing for redfish, is probably your go to. Um, this one has a particular weed guard, and I don't know how well you can see that, Davis, but. I went and put on a split ring and a swivel, and that'll help with your line twists. So when you're working this thing, you know, it's gonna be doing this. So you wanna make sure that your line isn't translating all that memory into, you know, knots and problems. Yeah, yeah. So twist, twist adding a swivel to your uh, spoon is very important. Very important. Of any size, any, you know, silver, gold. Well, you know what? One of the things I, I've noticed when you fish a spoon heavy, okay? Remember these spoons, these holes are stamped, okay, on a machine. You get an edge on them. So when you have a light leader, if you don't, if you tie like, like even if you tie a loop knot, that will wear down mm -hmm. your mono and you'll lose a fish. Mm -hmm. So what the, the reason I put swivels on my spoons is more for protecting my leader. You know, I mean, it definitely, in fact, it helps the motion too, but if you tie straight to your spoon, you're going to see a lot of spoons. They, they don't come with the split ring in this, and you've got to, got to put this on there because you're going to just start casting one day, and you're like, oh, there it goes. It just broke off, and that's why, because you weren't, every time I reel my line and I'm catching fish, I examine my leader. I, you gotta, you got to look at it. Like, after every fish, I, I look at my leader. Mm -hmm. What's going on here? Because... Something could have happened. A you know, a blue fish could have swam by, right. grabbed your leader, and you got yep. too excited. You missed the lure and hit the leader. You got to keep checking your leader and then the all next one the time. That you hook. Yeah. <laughs> I was just talking. I was, talk, I was talking to away. Austin mm -hmm. from Forneo. He's he's down here right now, kayaking baits out. Mm -hmm. Hooked a big shark, probably a hammerhead from the beach. Line snapped. I'm like, mm. I'm like, well, you know, I asked him. I was like, did you change your line? Mm. Well, he said, he said I was Goliath fishing with the rod not too long ago, and it was in the bridge. I'm like. That's why your line broke, yeah, bro. Yeah, the conversation normally starts off with, well, 
Well, did you change the line? So Probably I, it didn't end up good. I actually changed my line when I shark fish, and this is totally not weight fishing now. When I catch <laughs> big sharks in the beach, I change my line after pretty much every trip. I cut all the mono off and put new mono on. I just, it's not worth it. You're putting so much effort I into mean, catching one fish thing. that why would you waste, like, why would you take the chance? I would say the same thing about just going from fishing trip to fishing trip. I yeah. could have a whole brand new piece of leader on from a fishing trip. Almost always, when I go into another fishing trip, yeah. I'm cutting that leader off oh, yeah. and tying a new leader. No, very important. Um, you know, it might sound silly or wasteful, but at least I know all my connections are good. I looked over my line, I looked over my leader, yeah. and I feel good about my knots. You know. So here's the next question for you, Jason. Mm -hmm. What are some of the best spots to look for that hold fish, like docks, bridges, and what part of the Indian River is holding fish at the moment? Well, we're in a transition time, so you'll have days that are warm and fish will be doing warm day things and then you'll have a, a cold front come in and, and that will shut down and it'll translate into fish moving into deeper water or feeding at different parts of the day. Um, you know, I would say the pattern right now is beach fishing for pompano and whiting is kind of coming to be a thing. Really? Um, you heard of good, heard of good reports? Uh, about a week ago, I did pretty well. Got a bunch of whiting. We didn't get pompano, but the trip with the whiting? that, uh, they were they nice whiting. Yeah, they were wow. good size whiting. Where at? You know, uh, up insane. around the power yeah. plant area. So um, he's not gonna give the exact GPS numbers. <laughs> if you want the GPS numbers, you got to send David, uh, send Jason giant super chat, yeah. and he'll he'll send you all the numbers you want. Um, <laughs> but yeah, you know. <laughs> so you know when what were we just talking about? <laughs> We were talking about finding fish in the Indian River oh. during certain times of the year, and where are they holding docks, bridges? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's just going to come down to warmth or coolness. And like I was telling you the story before about the big red fish, um, the time that I went, I told a buddy of mine, hey, I want to fish from, I forget what it was, like 10 to 1. Mm -hmm. You know, and if I said, hey, Josh, I want you, we're going to go wade fishing from 10 to 1, you're going to go, well, why not we go early? Yeah. So that particular day was a cold front and um, high sunlight. Yeah. So you get high sunlight, it'll warm up that shallow water quicker. So you get the cold front of the, the pressure is building from the barometer and high sunlight, which is going to warm up that shallow water. So, I mean, if I'm not trying to tell a fish story, but we got probably a good dozen redfish all upper slot, um, all on pretty much, you know, the paddle tail stuff, jig heads, um, different sizes. Mm -hmm. um, and it was probably one of the best days of red fishing that I've had. And mm -hmm. I don't I don't tend to catch them a lot anymore. I mean, I don't know if it has to do with the lack of grass or, you know, a lot of people are fishing and keeping fish these days. But... Uh, you know, it, it, there's nothing wrong, folks, with letting a fish go. I mean, there's something really, really cool about catching a big fish and releasing it and then, you know, showing it a picture of, of the fish to someone. When you go and keep a fish and you kill it and you eat it, I mean, that's great, too. Don't get me wrong. I, there's not a flounder that I would release, Josh, okay? But uh, I'll tell you straight up. <laughs> You know what? If if you're in a situation where you can't properly keep that fish, let them go. Correct. Correct. Yeah. If you, let's say you show up, you don't got a cooler, whatever. You're not re you're ready to keep a fish. Yeah, I mean, you there's know what? nothing it, it, wrong with letting them go, dude. You know? you know, okay. Here's one of my things, right? And like, I am 100% pointing the finger at me when I say this, okay? But how many times? Have you gone out, caught a bunch of fish, put them in a freezer, put them in bags, and then they just, six months later, throw them away? Yeah, you kind of forget about them or, you know, life I'm gets dead in the serious. way. No, I'm... Dude, you go and whack the dolphin. I'm guilty of it too, Josh. So. You know, you honestly, I'm going to be straight up, I don't even like frozen fish. I won't eat it. I won't eat if it. If I don't eat it the day I caught it, yeah, I'm like, so like, seldomly. So take what you need. Mm -hmm. Like, if you, if you want to go and... Feed your neighbors, fantastic. Yeah. I, I'm all about that. I love giving fish away to my friends, and it's a great way to build a relationship with people. But, yeah, um, yeah don't don't take more than what you need. Have, that, that, I think that's just hundred percent. Yeah, 
you know, if you catch one big flounder, you got food, you know, like, but if you, if the flounder are stacked right. and you're catching 50 of them, right. you don't need, I mean, yeah, you don't even need if the rules 50. say you can keep 50 Correct. of them, which probably doesn't, but Correct. don't, 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 you don't need yeah. to kill that many. No. Um, best artificial use, for, best artificial lure for a jack, anything. <laughs> Top water. I mean, it depends how they're feeding, but. Something tells me I could rig this up with a hook. And drag it on the surface. It's, you know what? See, it's funny. The, sometimes, would, some, sometimes the giants. Still, they would probably grab it. Yeah, like a, a young dumb one. But sometimes the giants are they're they're <laughs> picky, pretty smart. Yeah, yeah I've seen them picky. Uh, top I've waters though, guys. Too, Poppers, yeah. stick baits like this right here. Oh, that's definitely. Game on. Twenty definitely. pound jack. Game over. So if game over. If I was over, on the beach funny. and I was fishing for those big jacks that you roam see the that beach? gigantic J hook on the back right there. Definitely need that. That's what that's for right there. This yeah. is actually this is designed for sharks and tarpon right there. Another word for jacks is called tackle busters. So if you fish stuff with weak hooks, you're probably gonna come back. See, this one won't even hook my finger. You're probably gonna come back with stories of bent hooks and lost fish compared to something really beefy like this that's probably super sharp. Let me ask you a question. Yes. Um, and this is actually just this isn't. A, I'm looking through the live chat, but mm -hmm. this is a, probably a really relevant question. How often? Do you find yourself getting more bites during a falling tide versus an incoming tide? Hmm. I'm going to have to say that's tide and spot related. Um, okay. Yes. So it's it's probably more spot related than, than tide related. Because um, I notice like sometimes I'm trying to like, think on to a falling it. tide, some areas you do very well because the fish are sitting, there's a drop off there and they're just sitting there Correct. waiting for Correct. the Correct. little bait fish to come well, off, the little but it, crabs. And right, that. but if you don't have that, that depth change and let's say you just got a shoreline where it's gradual, it's, it's, ma it's a mangrove and then it's just a gradual you yeah. know, difference. Um, and coming could be good. They you could know, be coming to mangroves looking for food. Correct, correct. Yeah. You know, normally the, the higher water will bring them closer to the bank and the lower the water will bring them further away from the bank. I have caught plenty of fish on the bank at low tide. I've caught plenty of fish at high tide out in the open. But that's just the rule of thumb. Lower tide out in the open, higher tide closer to the bank. That makes sense. How do you guys check the weather and waves inshore and offshore? Um, I use an app called Windfinder or iWind Surf. Uh, weather bug, weather underground, yeah, weather channel. Well. There's a million, million of them. Yeah. Um, I look for mostly wind. Yeah, I mean, down here. Direction of wind. Direction, yeah, direction, wind direction, because um, that determines what I'm gonna do. So like today, it's gonna be blowing from the north. Mm -hmm. Right now, it's kicking up. It's gonna be blowing over 20 knots. So that's gonna create a wash down the beach. So you gotta protect yourself. You Even in the go. river. I mean, the yeah, Indian River is set up north and south. So yeah. you get a north wind, it blows down that river. Mm -hmm. It's very tough to get out of a north wind. It is. You know what I mean? You gotta so. find structure that protects you like a little like yep. little I don't know little island Plain thing or a little mangrove edge yeah. or I mean anything really that'll break the wind all right here we go next one let's see mm -hmm. here wow we are way down in the comments Toss, uh, let's see can you ever do fishing small ponds so have you ever fished oh yeah 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 so uh, we'll, a lot of stuff we're talking about today is, is, is us fishing in the Indian River. Some people were asking about the Banana River. Have you fished the Banana River? I have, and funny story with that is my very first time wade fishing up there, I realized there is a lot of alligators or crocodiles. No, there's no crocodiles up there. Bro. Get out of here. I went up to, I don't know where it was, maybe Titusville, somewhere. I there were alligators a while in there? Ago. So not knowing where I was going, <laughs> I drove up there. I got to hear this story. I go... To a tackle shop. Why not, right? That's why not go to your local tackle shop? Exactly. So you go to your local tackle shop, or I go to the local tackle shop in the area. I'm like, hey, I'm I'm new to the area. I'm really big into wade fishing. Can you steer me in the right direction? So the guy tells me where to go. I follow his directions. Pristine area. I'm like, game on. This looks beautiful. So we go and park. We're we're getting in the water and it's like super muddy. And it's just miserably muddy right we're kind of over the mud so we kind of walk back to the truck we get in the truck we drive down this little trail and we see an alligator and we're like oh wow 
You know, it was like a little creek, and this is the How big is the alligator? Six foot. No, you know, that. whatever. Yeah. But we're just like, oh, wow, alligator. You know, not really thinking anything of it. I mean, it could have been a crocodile. We drive down this shoreline. Josh, this memory is so clear, it's crazy. Driving down this trail, and we start seeing groups of two, and then groups of three, and then it's like a field of freaking alligators. Get out of I, here. I've never seen anything. What time of year was this? It was warm, so it was probably maybe late spring, early summer. And there were um, alligators, big ones? A lot of them, too. Big ones, yes. like 10 footers. I mean, I didn't pull out the. So you didn't go out there waiting and try to go <laughs> hang out with them? Bro, I stuck my butt in the car and took a couple photos and kept it moving. That would be a viral video, you know? Yeah. Wade fishing in alligator, alligator infested yeah, waters. Hey, you want to go well, up there and we, film we, it? We still need to do our, our trash can video. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hint, don't, hint. don't, 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 don't hint, be giving away ideas hint, hint, now. Hint, hint. Um, okay, we're going to answer a few more questions, guys, and then we're going to call it. So, let's see here. Um, uh, so, Elijah's asking about uh, thoughts on St. Croix Triumph versus St. Croix Mojo versus uh, the Star Rods. Um, Whoever has a better warranty and better guides, that yeah, should be your decision. That's why I made mine the way my, I did. You know, I built the highest quality I mean, components and a lifetime warranty. Yeah, I mean, when I'm, I work in a tackle shop for all of you that don't know that. And when someone's coming in asking me for advice, I'm normally saying, do you have price preference? Do you have brand preference? And then that'll give me an answer on what kind of yeah. equipment or stuff to show them, you know, because... When you're beginning, I mean, you don't want to spend a ton of money, mm -mm. but at the same time, how crappy would you feel if you had spent a couple hundred dollars and your stuff just fell apart, you know what mm. I mean? So yeah. you, those rods you built look very, very high end. and Those are good rods. I mean, they don't look cheap at all, and no, you know a great what? price so, point. So <laughs> when I built the rods for Black to Beach, when I designed them, I said to myself, I have to use this. I fish really hard, mm -hmm. so it has to be able to withstand me. You got to be truthful to yourself. I, you know, I, I, I can't make a product that sucks. Mm -hmm. That's just not in my nature. Mm -hmm. You know, you see the videos we create, it has to be quality. Mm -hmm. So if it wasn't quality, I wanted nothing to do with it. Agreed. You know, and if I can't personally use it and fish with it without worrying about it, me breaking it, I'm not going to build it. Mm -hmm. You know, so that's why we built the rods, guys. And by the way, um, our rods right now, they're exclusively only on our website, blacktobage.com. That's the only place you can find them right now. Uh, we are working on getting rods in stores, but for right now, that's where you got to get them. We got a super chat from Nam Martin. After this is done, you should go and get a cup of coffee, bro. I agree. Two Unfortunately, cups. I don't drink coffee. I, I'll have I chew time. caffeine gum. So I'm going to be chewing some serious <laughs> caffeine gum after this. But thank you so much, man. I appreciate it. That ten dollars, I'm gonna go and buy some caffeine food. How about that? I'm gonna buy some caffeine bars. I don't know if I've ever had a caffeine. I'm bar. just, I'm, I, dude, I need to take some caffeine right I now. Mean, okay, I'm, I'm losing it. Okay, but yes, cups, cup to coffee. Uh, you know, we'll do, go do a Starbucks run. Thank uh. you so much. Um, okay, some someone someone kept asking questions about rattles in soft plastic. What are your thoughts on that? Great question. Whoever asked that, let me find it. Um, I saw that and I just remembered about it. Yes. It's a great question because I actually brought some. Really? Mm -hmm. So I do keep these in a little waterproof container, and I, uh, I can see why they corrode. Well, they can corrode. If you see what I did here, I just took a little piece of styrofoam because glass rattles. I don't know if there's any in here broken, but if you just throw them in something, glass yeah, rattles will break. Yeah. Will break. So you got to have some kind of like a styrofoam kind of holder and then like a little waterproof case to keep them in um, if you don't want these to break. I mean, I think I bought a, I don't know, a big pack of 50 a couple years ago and that's what I still have and I would say that's pretty good. Anyway, so Davis, you're going to really want to zoom in on this one because this could be, I don't know how well you can see that. Here, just hold it up. Um, no, hold it like here. But so. This, he sees it, he sees it. this point is extremely critical on when you purchase your rattle. Really? So if if this point... Move, move, move it a little more this way so it's just on the black there. Looks like that. that. 
it will not go in the rubber as easy oh, hold on. Hold closer up. and yeah. tend to come out of the rubber easier. If it has a little bit of a point, it's not only going to go in easier, it's going to normally stay in, you know. So you just kind of push it in nice and good, and then I normally just kind of force it in. I'm not rushing this, but you want to kind of push it in a little extra um, and then just feed it up so it doesn't really look like it has a big bulge in the belly looking all awkward. And then also, you know, when you push it in a little further towards the back, when you're when you're jigging or when you're catching fish, it doesn't you know tend to slide out, and then you're just wasting rattles. But um, it's, it's minor, nice. but it can make I, a difference. I could definitely tell, it can make a difference. or I could definitely say that I've been there, done that, where I go and add a rattle, or I don't know where the scent is that I had, but adding some scent to the rubber bait mm -hmm. can in immediately trigger a bite. Oh, yeah. I mean, going and throwing, throwing, working an area, and then all of a sudden, you know, having a rattle you, you or gotta, something. You got to go after their senses. You have, you have sight, smell, and your la the lateral lines. Feel. Yeah. So mm -hmm. you got to gotta keep changing up those three mm -hmm. things. Uh, someone asked, what's your favorite fish? Claire actually asked, what's your favorite fish you've caught while waiting? That's a good one. Uh, I would say the 14-pound trout. Favorite I mean, I fish? I mean, yeah, it's pretty hard to to <laughs> not say that giant sea Besides trout. Besides that trout, what's your favorite fish? So, I, I didn't necessarily catch it wading, but there's this spot where we wade, okay? And mm -hmm. there's this dock that we walk out on to look down the flat to see if anyone's fishing there. Yeah. So, there was this one time, me and my buddy Brennan were out there, and we walk out to the dock, and I'm just doing my normal looking down the flat, see if anyone's there. And I randomly happen to look in the water, and there's a giant snook sitting on the end of this dock. Mm -hmm. So I holler and wave my hand to my buddy. I said, hey, man, there's there's a giant snook, you know, bring a, bring a pole. Let's try to fish for him. So he doesn't even, you know, he don't know what I'm, he barely can hear me. So he just grabs a pole, didn't tie anything on it, just so happened to have a shrimp tied on the rod. Yeah, yeah. I throw to this fish that I see. The fish spooks. Oh. Like, damn. So I throw to where I think he spooked to. Now this is where it gets awesome. From an you know, a higher perspective, looking down on what's taking place, seeing your shrimp coming, you know, out of like dark water, coming closer to you, and then seeing a fish coming behind it, coming at you, and watching it eat it's so cool at you mm. like that probably has to be stuck in the memory bank more than anything because it was a visual thing when you can you know that's why i love kobe fishing so much oh because it's visual. so visual you know bottom fishing for kobe sucks but like when you're actually sight fishing cobia mm -hmm. anything sight fishing where is the were greatest. you uh virginia was that Virginia where you what? were on that big pile? I think you were by a piling. Yeah. And like a giant Kobe. 60, 65, 70 pounder. you were pounder. using an, ale, an eel or something yeah. or a jig. I don't remember. But that was epic. That was a giant Kobe. Dude, yeah. you know the funny thing with Kobe is you think you go up there and you will second guess everything you know about fishing. You'll be like. Oh, that's a shark. No. No, no, no. that's a Kobe. No, 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 no. You'll <laughs> see the Kobe. Oh, okay. You'll throw them a thready, mm. a menhaden, mm. an eel. A bucktail. And they just don't even... They don't even flinch. You're just like, wow. They don't eat. Dude, everyone come back to the dock at the end of the day, but they, and we're all looking at you like, yep, they don't eat. Hmm. Dude, they're, 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 I, I would say cobia are the most miserable fish ever. The great... I think we're, that's what makes them so awesome to me, because, like, they can turn you down and make you second-guess everything you know. I and that a, is awesome. I have a very similar story about that. One yeah. of my very first... Kobe experiences, just like you're saying, you got all the prime stuff, the jigs, the live baits, the this and that, and we're fishing them off of sharks, off Stewart. Mm -hmm. So oh, they don't, we, we they, see them. They don't leave the sharks. You know, we're, we're seeing yeah. the fish, and we're trying everything in the books. Nothing's working. And I'm like, who was I with? I was with I think this guy, Paul. So I'm like, Paul, what do you what do you got that we haven't tried? 
He's like, ah, oh, there's some rank squid in that front hatch if you want to try it. it. Stinks, be careful, you know? And I'm just like, whatever. So I go, I mean, it's thought out rank squid, Josh. It's not even in a cooler. Oh. So, so I'm, you know, I'm trying whatever. I'm like, screw it, I'll try it. So I go and, you know, I think I had a just a Freddy on or something like that. I rip it off, I put this funky piece of squid on, throw it to the cobia that I'm seeing, jig it, put it in a pole holder and walked away and my buddy hollered to me, hey, your pole, you got a fish on. Yeah. And this is after them swimming up to a, a, a livey and not wanting anything, swimming up to a jig, not wanting anything. And then this funky squid. That's So that's one of the things with Kobe, Kobe that I've learned. Um, and Kobe is, I could talk about Kobe for hours, see, but I've had days, Davis was actually there one day, we had a million Kobe on the boat. Mm. And we were trying through everything. They weren't hitting anything. And then we started off, we were just putting little chunks of Blue Runner on small hooks. Hmm. That's and what that's they, what did the that's trick? What, that's what got them going. Wow, wow. And then once they all started feeding, that's when they. That's when we got, you know, started you getting them, them bucktails happy, and that. Yeah. But, yeah, you just got to get them happy. And you got to just, sometimes you got to throw small baits. You know, there are there, 70 pounders in there, but. We but we had to start throwing little 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 chunks. But what you're explaining is experimental thinking. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean. Cobia will make you go crazy. I mean, like I said, they'll make you say, like, how can the fish not eat a sardine, a live sardine? I, I would mean, agree. you're just like, what is going agree. on right now? I but, would agree. But they don't, and I mean, you're just like, you got to be kidding me. Well, by you talking about that, it, it makes me think about dock light fishing for snook, okay? This is kind of not too long of a conversation, but dock light fishing for snook, live shrimp, mullet, you got the best lures, they all look great, whatever. You can see the fish in the dock mm -hmm. lights. Yeah. So you throw the, the lure, the bait, whatever, and, and sometimes they're interested and sometimes they're not. But this one particular time that I'm thinking of, they would be interested, swim over to the bait, and then just shy away swim over to the bait and shy away and wouldn't you know it but i don't know what it was still to this day but like you know those little bugs that like to hang out and and in, in lighted docks whatever they are whatever kind of bug it is whether it's a mosquito or a yeah, fly yeah, 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 yeah. Or just a bug right so a bug would show up in this light and land on the water yeah and they would lose their mind really and attack it that's crazy. Okay, you're talking something probably not even close to the size of my fingernail. Dude. I mean, a bug. Uh, when I but grew I'm up, giving them beautiful shrimp and mullet and this. When and I grew that up and, on the great, I grew up in the Great Lakes fishing for smallmouth bass, and one of my favorite times of the year was when the, the mayflies, the June, we call them June bugs, would um, hatch, mm. and the smallies just went psycho. Mm. You'd be out there early morning, you're pop, 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 pop. <laughs> all hitting the mayflies on the surface and you could throw anything and they, oh, they just smoke it God. you know and they were big small like, oh. like St. Lake St. Clair has got jumbos like mm. I've caught you know I'm not boasting right now but I've caught so many five six pounders you I was gonna say what's a jumbo water. small yeah, to me uh, a jumbo to me seven plus pounds you know a six pounder is a really nice one it's a giant to a lot of people but that's seen, how my that's how my so first experience was with peacock bass yeah so I never caught peacock bass till I went down south Florida and you know, I, didn't, I never thought a, a, a three-pound fish could fight harder than a five-pound fish. Mm -hmm. And, man, if you had a peacock bass and a largemouth bass in a dark alley, oh, peacock I'm pretty smoke. sure that peacock bass is going to show them who's boss. Oh, cause... yeah, he would, 100%. <laughs> Last question here, guys. What uh -oh. baits do you recommend on jetties for snook? Bucktails. Ooh, that's hard to beat. Yeah, I would have yeah, to say Yeah, flare hogs. Yeah, Definitely. bucktails 100%. So when you're fishing a jetty and Josh will I mean, even a swim bait, this, a swim bait, you know? Would you rather lose a $3 lure or an $8 lure? Mm. I'll burn through the $3 lures. And the $3 lure is normally the bucktail. So if you're trying to learn an area, you know, and really figure out where fish are in a water column or whatever the case may be, a, a feather jig is honestly probably the cheapest, most effective way to fish because it's probably even cheaper than a spoon mm -hmm. you know a little bucktail you could probably bring a little bucktail anywhere yeah they're, they're cheap and, as can catch be. fish last well, there was one more question this is this is it right here guys look at this yeah that's well what, what happened to the, the, the red one 
The red one? The red head? Yeah. Did you pull it off? Uh, Here, okay, this is this is the best all time favorite bait. Yeah, you did pull it off. Right here. Just electric chicken mm -hmm. for waiting. Jig head. Boom. It's a catch all bait. Catches everything right there. I mean, honestly, if, if I'm gonna throw, if I only had one lure, it'd be this right here for Indian for the Indian River. Could be different is, somewhere else, but as, as much as I love this, and I'm gonna really, are you really gonna say that? Disagree. So the reason I'm gonna disagree. Well, the shrimp is so universal, and that's why. Yeah. So, but for where we fish, I'm I'm going electric chicken because I'll, I'll fish yeah, you with that. Yeah. No, and I, I would agree. I mean, yeah. if I'm gonna if I'm gonna fish against somebody or if I want one bait to throw in a lot of scenarios, yeah. it's probably going to be this. Yeah. But, but the shrimp is universal. Yeah, totally. Whether it's cold, warm, shallow, deep. A shrimp. Offshore cowboy, super chat. Thank you, man. Uh, it says, Josh, I love your videos. Do more inshore fishing. We will do more coming inshore fishing. Soon. It's coming up soon. Big, big trout season's coming up soon. Mm -hmm. Guys, on that note, we are going to end the stream. So thank you, Jason, so much for coming thank out. You. Appreciate thank it. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And I uh, hope you guys learned a lot. And uh, we'll be on again soon with more tips and techniques on every form of fishing. So thanks for watching, guys. And we'll see you next time.